Ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha, and while I did speak quite openly and publicly that I was aware of this article, a great many people are still reaching out to me and asking my thoughts on the matter surrounding Zoe Quinn in the post-millennial article showcasing how her allegations against Alec Holoka are likely fabricated. At the very least, her accounting of events do not at all line up with her own public statements on social media. A fair warning, I will not be censoring myself in any way within this video, and the subject matter might not be fit for younger ears. I say that now, so if any concerned parents or people caring for young children are about, you would at least have some time to be able to hit the pause button before I end up saying something that would put parents or caregivers into a difficult position. I will do my best to line up information in as concise a manner as possible before I offer up my full thoughts on this issue, and I will include any new links in the description below. We already have the previous video in place with all of those links, so there's no need for me to duplicate work. If you need to call any of those up, that video is there for you. Now, I will post a card to that previous video in the upper right corner of your screen, but to sum up, Zoe Quinn accused Alec Holoka of some pretty terrible things publicly on social media that included not only physical, but emotional abuse. As a result of that post, cancel culture went into full swing. The other developers of Night in the Woods publicly cut ties with Holoka over the allegations made. Anita Sarkeesian attempted to piggyback herself onto this allegation and others, cheering over the gaming world having its own Me Too movement, herself then attempting to act the concerned public figure when Holoka took his own life. After the unfortunate suicide of Holoka, things got even worse within the cancel culture circles. Holoka's sister posted an announcement on Twitter in which she stated she believed survivors, something that is quite common with members of the ideological far left, which many council culture enthusiasts have incorrectly taken to mean she was admitting Holoka's guilt. As I said, mere days after her cheering for Holoka being pilloried on social media, Anita Sarkeesian changed her tune, attempting to pass herself off as someone supportive online. A Brianna Wu attempted to use the tragedy for her own agenda, attempting to make the whole thing about Gamergate, and even accused Gamergate of being responsible for multiple mass shootings, also imploring law enforcement to, quote, investigate credible threats. However, whether she meant that in reference to those accused of similar acts or simply to investigate members of Gamergate, it cannot be determined from her statements. Scott Benson, one of the other developers of Night in the Woods, released a lengthy Medium post that aired even more dirty laundry in a clear effort to also paint himself as a victim of emotional abuse at Holoka's proverbial hands before the body was even cold, piling on to the cancel culture court of public opinion that had already ended with Holoka taking his own life. Zoe Quinn then suspended her own Twitter account, only to later remove that suspension, stating that disabling the account also disabled two-factor authentication, making the account more vulnerable to hacking attempts. Also, in my previous video, I spoke at length concerning both Blackstone's ratio and the concept of innocent until proven guilty, decrying the mob mentality tactics conducted in the court of public opinion and just how terrible and monstrous it really is. I won't attempt to duplicate work, though. It was, at least I think, pretty well done as far as that's concerned, and I'd urge you to go have a listen if you haven't already. If you have, I'd urge you to go back and listen a second time. And now we have the post-millennial article. In that article, they point out that Quinn did not specify when the alleged incident occurred. However, a YouTube video had captured the now-deleted tweets that showed she was preparing to leave for Winnipeg at the end of March 2012 and had arrived late March, early April of that year. Quinn claims she was physically confined to Holoka's apartment and isolated from the outside world. Her Twitter posts show a very different picture, as while she was in Winnipeg, she was apparently shopping for material to make plushies and working on a project they called It's Not OK Cupid. Also, there was a statement that she ended up in a musical somehow. Her and Holoka also arranged multiple meetups in mid-April and early May. In late April, she also apparently appeared on a podcast with Holoka called Indie Function, and the article also contains several audio clips from that broadcast. The article also discusses how Quinn accused Holoka of taking over and edging her out of the It's Not OK Cupid project, while the article states that the podcast, as well as Quinn's own public tweets, run counter to that argument. And I'm going to read a couple of lines from this article. In the August 28th statement, Quinn also says that upon the rapid, anxious escape from the abusive circumstances with Holoka with the help of a roommate, the man did not so much as acknowledge the departure. But a May 4th, 2012 tweet states that Quinn and Holoka were working hard to crunch on It's Not OK Cupid just hours before the flight, entirely disproving the claim. The article continues, Interestingly, after Quinn's return to Toronto, Holoka and Quinn exchanged several light-hearted public tweets into the month of May as their work on It's Not OK Cupid continued. 
Now, this is, bear in mind, only a rough summation, and I can't stress enough that those interested go read the full article for themselves. I don't want to run through all of the information because they did some good work here, and I don't intend to divert traffic from them, but rather encourage more traffic to this article. And my own thoughts on this topic initially were made abundantly clear. However, seeing this additional information, seeing how this supposedly mentally and physically abused woman continued to not only engage with her abuser, but enthusiastically engage with him in a public and private manner, just screams red flag to me. We all know that the trio that is Zoe Quinn, Anita Sarkeesian, and Brianna Wu are ideological opportunists under even the most generous of interpretations of their actions over the years. I, however, tend to be far more direct. Zoe Quinn is a scam artist. That much is evident enough with her Chuck Tingle video game that she received over $85,000 in funding only to abandon the project. She was confirmed to have admitted to deliberately sabotaging the Polaris game jam, and she has been proven to have been a liar in countless instances to the point where I strongly suspect she is indeed nothing more than a pathological liar. Regardless, she's built her career off of victimhood alongside Sarkeesian and Wu. She made a public allegation in a direct attempt to both attain sympathy and to also discredit and destroy a man through the court of public opinion as opposed to taking it to the authorities seven years ago. But this is the world of cancel culture. It is mob rule that deliberately ignores any and all factual evidence in favor of believing alleged victims at all costs. Since that video and my posts on Twitter, I've seen a great many arguments made against my statements that innocent until proven guilty should be ignored. The most common threads follow along the lines of attempted virtue, of concern due to the inactivity of legal departments or the sheer difficulty to prove such crimes. I've even seen people attempt to cancel me to a lesser and completely ineffectual extent over something as simple as saying that an issue such as this being far too potentially damaging to be tried in the court of public opinion. I look at people like Zoe Quinn, Anita Sarkeesian, Brianna Wu, and their ilk, and all I see is poison. A group that claims so much virtue, that claims to be standing up for people's rights and for equality, yet exhibit none of the virtues they expect others to adhere to. What I see are authoritarians, people who espouse a set of rules, yet expect to not be forced to abide by the same. Now, I'm reminded of what Friedrich Nietzsche wrote once upon a time. Thus I speak to you in a parable. You who make souls whirl, you preachers of equality, to me, you are tarantulas and secretly vengeful. But I shall bring your secrets to light, therefore I laugh in your faces with my laughter of the heights. Therefore I tear at your webs, that your rage may lure you out of your lie holes, and your revenge may leap out from behind your word justice. For that man be delivered from revenge, that is for me the bridge to the highest hope, and a rainbow after long storms. The tarantulas, of course, would have it otherwise. What justice means to us is precisely that the world be filled with the storms of our revenge. Thus they speak to each other. We shall wreak vengeance and abuse upon all whose equals we are not. Thus do the tarantulas' hearts vow, and will to equality shall henceforth be the name for virtue, and against all that has power we want to raise our clamor. You preachers of equality, the tyrannomania of impotence clamors thus out of you for equality. Your most secret ambitions to be tyrants thus shroud themselves in the words of virtue. A grieved conceit, repressed envy, perhaps the conceit and envy of your fathers, erupt from you as a flame and as the frenzy of revenge. They are like enthusiasts, yet it is not the heart that fires them but revenge. And when they become elegant and cold, it is not the spirit but envy that makes them elegant and cold. Their jealousy leads them even on the paths of thinkers, and this is the sign of their jealousy. They always go too far, till their weariness must in the end lie down to sleep in the snow. Out of every one of their complaints sounds revenge. In their praise there is always a sting, and to be judged seems bliss to them. But thus I counsel you, my friends, mistrust all in whom the impulse to punish is powerful. They are people of a low sort and stock, the hangman and the bloodhound look out of their faces. Mistrust all who talk much of their justice. Verily their souls lack more than honey, and when they call themselves the good and the just, do not forget that they would be Pharisees if only they had power. That was written in the late 1800s, well over 100 years ago, and yet so disturbingly apt even now. Yes, that is what I see when I look at Zoe Quinn and her ilk. A bunch of people that use victimhood to claim virtue, but are individuals that thirst for nothing more than power and the ability to use ideology and the concept of equality as tools to subjugate others. 
Zoe Quinn was running low on social capital that she could use to print money for herself. So she concocted this story that, due to the evidence at hand, is extremely suspect in order to catapult herself back into the spotlight. In the so doing, she showed a complete lack of caring what sort of damage she would cause or whose lives she would potentially destroy with her allegations. Except this time, it literally cost a life. Whether guilty or innocent Alec Holoka was already in an unstable emotional state, this much has been acknowledged by his fellow developers, his sister, and even by Zoe Quinn herself. For a person that already felt the world was against him, what else is there? With an allegation such as that, it no longer matters if it is true or not. His ability to work in the industry was completely destroyed merely due to the possibility that it might be true. Friends turning against him, career destroyed. I don't agree with his decision, but I can see how a person in his position might come to that decision. And that is just one of the many reasons why cancel culture is so dangerous and so damaging. It preys upon people's fears. Yes, but even more dangerously than that, it preys upon people's desire to protect. People like Zoe Quinn weaponize that, deliberately so, in order to garner sympathy, professional opportunity, and personal wealth through the direct manipulation of those two aspects of people's psyche. All the while, claiming that they themselves are the virtuous ones that are nothing more than victims that bravely continue to fight for equality and justice. Well, we've seen the results of their particular brand of justice, and I, for one, want no part of it. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, I am Sid Alpha, and I'll see you next time.